Joss, you can start. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katarina. So, good morning, everyone, and for many of you, welcome back. Thank you for tuning into the next webinar related to the implementation of the new veterinary regulation, regulation 2019-6. Today's webinar is a follow-up session of the one that we held in 10 November 2021, with the focus on collection and recording of suspected adverse events for veterinary medicinal products. My name is Jos Olas. I'm the head of Veterinary Risk and Surveillance at EMAS Veterinary Medi Medicines Division. So the veterinary medicinal products uh, calls, the, the regulation calls for the establishment of a union farm goods database by the 28th of January 2022. And we are approaching that date in a couple of weeks, very soon. The European Medicines Agency will therefore launch an enhanced and an upgraded Eurovigilance veterinary EVVET3, it's called, system to process and to manage those messages. The webinar today is part of a series of training events on the new EVVET3 system, and it will provide general principles on the topics to highlight uh, from questions that we have received from the last one. So we will come back to certain elements that you have highlighted where you had questions on. So we'll start with that. And then we will follow with the demonstration of the basic functionalities of EV system for recording, searching, and downloading suspected adverse event reports. Tomorrow we have a follow-up session focused on the analysis of the data as part of signal management and the submission of signals and the annual statements. At the end of the sessions, there is an allocated about 40 minutes for your questions. Uh, we would ask you to please, like last time, type your questions into the chat uh, or when you all will be prompted by one of us so you, you can then also uh, take the floor if you raise your hands after, after the session. We will respond to some of the questions already immediately if we can in, in the chat. So, as I said, the implementation date of the 28th of January is approaching soon, and uh, we all know we're going towards some major changes in terms of pharmacovigilance. Everyone is working still hard at member state level, company level, and within the agency as well to be ready. Uh, inevitably, there will be some teething issues, questions for which we have no immediate answers yet. Uh, also, if some of the database systems are not 100% operational or not all data available, we will be looking for some workarounds. Um, still, two principles in mind, I would say. Uh, we will make sure that we adhere to the basic requirements of the regulation and that we also will ensure that always we can safeguard at EU level uh, the safe use of veterinary medicinal products uh, post authorization. In that sense, some of the good elements is that we still have room in further developing and improving our procedures, and we intend to do that together with you. So we are we're looking forward to your questions that will help us improving the systems. Um, so particularly, we're still working on how to implement this new regulation from a risk-based approach so that we can ensure that we have an efficient use and, and lower the administrative burden. Um, we are, we all know we are depending very much on the functionalities of the new systems. Um, and there also we are asking for your feedback, a little bit of your patience as well. It's obvious that the initial release of those systems will require some further improvements that will happening after the, the 28th still. If you have, after the session, still some additional questions, we ask you to email us at vetchange.program at ema.europe.eu. We will type that email in the chat as well. Now, now, also, please be reminded that today's webinar is being recorded for training purposes, and it will be made available on EMA work corporate website in the coming weeks. By continuing being in this session today, you are cons consenting to be recorded. Your personal data will be processed by EMA in accordance with Regulation 2018-1725.
if you do not agree, then we please ask you to leave the meeting uh, now. So after this short introduction, and without further ado, I'll pass the floor to my colleague, Laura Descalzo, who is the expert in running the different systems. Thank you very much again, Laura, for your support. Good luck. Thank you, Dios. And good morning and welcome, everybody, to the webinar. So, as just mentioned, on the first part of the webinar, we will cover a few topics that we thought it may be worth highlighting again, even though they may have been covered during the previous webinars. Next slide, please, Katarina. So, in this presentation, first we will present these topics to highlight. Then uh, we will continue with a demo session using the EVVET system, and I will show you how to log in, how to record an adverse event re report, how to search for reports for your products and on an organization basis, and how to download those reports. Also, how to submit a follow-up and an allocation report, and then how to search on your mailbox as well. And then we will have a question and answer session. Next slide, please. So the first topic that we believed uh, is worth highlighting again is related to the AER ID or the Unique Adverse Event Identification Number. So this ID uh, should be unique for each adverse event and it is composed of three parts. On the first part, it is the country of occurrence of the adverse event report. It is a three-digit code now as mandated by VICH and oh can we go to the previous slide please still and this part uh, is common to both the uh, NCA or AER ID and the MAH AER ID so the and it is worth noting that this is the only place in which the country of occurrence can be stated on the AER. So it is very important to complete this part of the ID correctly. Then the second part of the AER ID for national competent authorities, regulatory authorities, uh, consists of an eight-digit code that can be found for each authority on the GL30 guideline. Uh, we've shown some examples there on the slide, and we have included also a link to the VICH guideline where you can find all the VICH regulatory authorities identify a code. Uh, we have been advised by some uh, regulatory authorities that the addresses mentioned on the VICH guideline are not up to date. So our VICH representative in the agency will highlight this to the VICH uh, group so this information can be amended. Can we go to the next slide, please? With regards to marketing authorization holders, uh, the way to make up this ID uh, is slightly different. The first part, uh, the country of occurrence is the same. It consists of the three digit code, country code. But then for the MAH org ID, it is also stated that it's an eight-digit code, but uh, there is no specific code uh, mandated for each organization. So the advice is to make this code unique. The marketing authorization holders should take their 
routing ID, which is the code that the organization is assigned when they register with Udra Vigilance Veterinary and enter this code in capital letters, if possible, on a CRC32 hash generator, which uh, generates an algorithm, an eight-digit code, that can be used then for the organization as their MAH org ID for all the reports. So you do not need to generate this code for every report. You generate it once for your organization, and that is the code that you will use for all your adverse event reports. Then uh, to advise uh, the advice is that the organization also includes the routing ID as part of the free text part of the case number, which is the next part, to ensure, to help ensuring that uh, this number is unique. So, to repeat again, then the AER ID for marketing authorization holders would consist on the three-digit country code, the MAH org ID that has been generated from the routing ID, then a, a dash, then the routing ID plus remaining free text, which is up to 47 digits. And when we do the demo, I will show you where you can find the routing ID, the organization routing ID in the system. And if we go to the next slide, please. So the advice that we mentioned before uh, the, was related to uh, AERs that will be submitted in the new VICH format. With regards to those organizations that are not yet VICH compatible and will submit uh, adverse event reports in DEG format, for, uh, the advice is as follows. For new initial AER that will be recorded in the system, after the 28th of January, the new rules for the creation of AER ID also applies to the new AERs recorded on DG format. And for, we have included on the slide an example for the Danish competent authority. So it will include the three digit country code slash the regulatory authority ID slash and the number. And for marketing authorization holders, it will be also the three-digit country code, the MAHID, and then the slash. And then on the free part, it is also advised, if possible, if the routing ID of the organization can be included, plus any other free text. And if we go to the next slide, please. Then, with regards to follow-ups that are sent after the 28th of January for reports that had been previously submitted to EVVET on the EG format, obviously because a VICH format will start now, it will be allowed for a period of time for the AER ID not to comply with the VICH format, because otherwise it will not be possible to submit those follow-up reports. However, the only requirement is that the AER ID need to contain, needs to contain at the beginning the two or three digit country code for the country of occurrence because otherwise it will not be possible to identify the country of occurrence of the, uh, at, on the adverse event report. If the AER 
that uh, you are trying to submit a follow-up for does not contain the two or three digit letter country code for on the AERID, on the existing uh, AERID, which is called the worldwide case number in EVVET2. So if the EVVET2 worldwide case number does not contain a country code at the beginning, then if you, tr if you need to send a follow-up, you should nullify the existing AER and submit a new AER report. So the next topic to cover uh, will be uh, how to record initial follow-ups, uh, initial reports and follow-up in the system in regards to the field original receive date and date of current submission. So for initial AERs, the original receipt date should be the date of the receipt of the initial information from the primary source. And the type of report will be uh, initial or expedited. And this will uh, allow the calculation of the 30-day compliance uh, because this is calculated from the message receive date. And then with regards to follow-up reports, when uh, a follow-up is submitted to the system, the original receive date should never be changed. So it should remain as per the initial report. However, the type of report then should be changed to follow-up. And with regards to the date of current submission, for both initial AERs and follow-ups is the date when the AER is recorded in EVVET. And we will show this on the demo, how to record this information. Next slide, please. Then the next topic that we are going to cover on the following slides is related to the access policy and access to the information on the reports, depending on various aspects. One of them, the type of organization, so whether you are a marketing authorization holder or a national competent authority. And then the other aspects we will look at as well is whether the organization has sent the report or whether it is an owner of one or more of the products mentioned in the report. So we are going to have a look at a few examples that are shown here on the table. And let's take a look firstly at scenario two. So in this scenario, we have, well, first I will explain the makeup of the organization. So we have an organization which has one headquarter and various affiliates. So the headquarter organization is called Actribo and it's got uh, the organization uh, ID sh shown here. Uh, which is the ID in, uh, registered on the organization management system. And I will show later on what we will use this for during the demo. And this organization has uh, the affiliate Viobet uh, JSC and another affiliate called Chemtech DK, both of which are also registered in Udravegio. So for scenario two, in this instance, we have the head of quarter organization, so ACTREBO, is sending an adverse event report mentioning a product, product B, which belongs to marketing authorization holder, which is the affiliate one. So what will be the different levels of access that the different organizations will have? The headquarter affiliate, uh, the headquarter organization will have 
what is called level three access, which is the highest level of access. They can see all those organizations that have are granted level three access to our report have access to all the information in all the fields. And this is because the headquarter organization has sent the report to the system. Hence, they have level three access. Affiliate one, because Affiliate one owns one of the products mentioned in the report, will have a level two access to the report. This means that they will have access to the case narrative and most of the other fields, apart from some fields related to personal data such as the data from the primary source and a few other fields. But uh, this will level two access will grant access to the case narrative. With regards to affiliate two, because they are not a sender of the report and they don't own any of the products mentioned on the adverse event report, they will only have level one access to the report, which is uh, the same level of access as any external organization, any external marketing authorization holder. With regards to the national competent authorities, they always have level three access to all the reports in the database. So they will always be able to see all the fields in the report. Then we will look at the next scenario. So in this case, affiliate one will send the report to the system. And the product mentioned in the report is one of their products. How does this impact the access? The headquarter always inherits the le highest access level from any of the affiliates. So the headquarter in this instance will have level three access, even though they have not sent the report to the system. With regards to affiliate one, because they are the sender of the report, they will have level three access as well. And as in the previous case, affiliate two, because they do not own any of the products mentioned on the report, they will not have they will not have access to the case narrative. So they will have level one access, the same as any external organization. So what happens then on the third scenario here, on scenario four that we are going to mention, when the sender organization is a national competent authority, a regulatory authority. The report, the product included in the report belongs, is product A belonging to the headquarter. So because uh, the product mentioned belongs to the headquarter, the headquarter organization will be granted level two access to this report sent by the competent authority. However, the, both the affiliate organizations, as they do not own any of the products mentioned in the report, they will have level one access, the same as any other marketing authorization holder that do not have any products mentioned in the report. And as before, the national competent authorities, regulatory authorities will have level three access. And let's go to the next slide. And in here, uh, we will show some of the fields that are uh, restricted for example, for level two. So uh, who has level two? As we mentioned before, uh, the owner of the product and the headquarter organization from the hierarchy to which 
uh, the MAH hierarchy for which the sender belongs. And level two access grants you access to the case narrative and many of the other field, but it uh, does not grant you access, for example, to the uh, information related to the primary source, the information included on the last name. We will uh, explain during the uh, demo what information should be included on the primary uh, report uh, section to uh, guarantee anonymity of the primary source. And if we go to the next slide, please. So as we mentioned before, level three access is granted to the sender of the report and to the headquarter organization, and uh, none of the fields are restricted here. So the sender can access to all the information in the report, as well as the, all the NCAs. And uh, we have included here a link to the access policy. And next uh, slide, please. With regards to level one, all marketing authorization holders will have access to level one uh, information for all the reports included in the database. And if we go to the next slide, uh, the important uh, thing to mention here is that the case narrative will not be accessible. And if we go to the next slide, please. With regards to uh, registration to EVVET, we are going to update the registration manual, it is being updated at the moment, and will be published very shortly on the EMA website, and we will include the link on the slide. It is important to note that uh, users that are currently registered in the system do not need to be registered. So there roles will be that they have currently in EVVET 2 will be moved seamlessly to EVVET 3. And marketing authorization holders will be granted additional rights to the EVVET data warehouse. This is the system for um, data analysis that will be demonstrated tomorrow on the webinar related to signal management. However, you will have to reset your passwords and a communication has been sent to all users this week in this regard. And with regards to these new passwords, it is important to note that uh, other EMA applications such as, for example, Uteralink that use the, this, what is called the single sign-on passwords the new password that you have reset for EVVET should be also used for any other EMA applications. And please, let's go to the next slide. So one thing that is important to mention is that as we've seen on the slides, on the previous slides, um, it is important to know uh, who the marketing authorization holder of a product is in order to grant the relevant information to the adverse event report. With regards to this, there is a process that is called recoding, and it is partially automated and partial manual, depending on the kind of information that has been included on the report. I will go into more details when we do the demo because it will be easier to explain. But uh, in order to grant what we call the level two access, it is important that uh, the product uh, mentioned on the report exists 
in the union product database and a link established between the product mentioned on the report and the product in the union product database. However, uh, by the 28th of January, perhaps not all product data will yet exist, not all products will be included in the union product database or the data will not yet be recorded. So the link may not have yet been established between the product mentioned in the report and the product in the union product database. For those cases, it will not be possible to grant level two access to the marketing authorization holders. So, because we recognize that this is an issue in the initial, uh, when the system initially goes live, uh, there are some mitigating measures have been established. For example, national competent authorities have agreed that they will forward the adverse event reports to the relevant marketing authorization holders for the cases that the NCAs record in EVVET. So the marketing authorization holders should receive those cases. The gateway NCA eh, marketing authorization holders will receive them in their systems and I will demo how to how marketing authorization holders that are web traders can access that information from their mailbox. However, it is important to mention that those marketing authorization holders that are web traders will not be able to send follow-ups to those reports that the NCAs have sent to them from their mailbox. Another mitigating measure uh, to allow for uh, the inclusion of the products in the UPD and for recoding is that the due dates for the signal management obligations from the marketing authorization holders have been set up only for centrally authorized products until at least June 22 to give a time for the system to catch up and to allow for the granting on this level two access to the marketing authorization holders. Also, the advice is for any cases that uh, if the, tomorrow uh, we are going to show how to bypass some of these issues as well and how the marketing authorization holders will be able to access their cases in the data warehouse on the basis of the reported product name. So if the marketing authorization holders access the data warehouse and find that uh, any potential signals that may require immediate regulatory action, but they cannot access the full case information for some of the cases involved in that potential signal, there are two steps that the marketing authorization holders may take to mitigate this issue. In the first instance, they should contact the relevant national competent authority and the NCA to request for the product to be added to the union product database so the marketing authorization holder can then uh, access the case narrative in order to fulfill their legal obligations. But as we mentioned, this will be for cases that you believe may need immediate regulatory action, not for all instances. And then uh, for those cases as well, if the product, you can see that the product is already included in the UPD, but you do not have access to the case narrative, uh, that means that the information may not yet be recorded. So if you need urgent access to 
those reports because you may, you think that immediate regulatory action may be needed for a potential signal. In this instance, where the product is in the UPD, but the case narrative is not yet feasible, please contact the EMA so we can prioritize the recording. So the linking of the product mentioned on the adverse event report to the product in the UPD, so then the MAH can be granted access to the case narrative and they can fulfill their legal obligation. So if we go to the next slide. So for the next part of the webinar, uh, I'm going to start the demo session. So what we are going to cover on the demo session is how to log in and how to select an organization because some of the users may have one or more organizations for which they are responsible for. I will also show how to create an initial adverse event report, so various aspects of the data entry, how to record the number of animals affected, species and breed information, how to enter product data uh, for various potential cases, like for example, how to select when the a product when it's already included on the UPD, one for uh, entry for which you may only know a part of the name of the product, and I will also show you how to record information for a product that is not either yet available on the Union Product Database, or it could be, for example, a third country product name that is not included on the database. I will also show you how to save a partial entry, how to import then the case and complete the information. Uh, also how to copy the information of one report and send two or more cases as part of a batch. And then we'll have a break and after the break I will show you how to search for a uh, cases in various manners, so how to search for a specific AER and then how the different levels of the access will be granted dependent on the aspects that we showed earlier, so ownership of the product, whether you were the sender or not, etc. And then uh, I will also show how to do a more global search, so for example for a specific marketing authorization holder for a period of time. So uh, how to download the cases related to one marketing authorization holder. And I will also show how to send a follow-up and a notification for an existing report, and then how to find acknowledgement messages on the mailbox for reports that you may have sent to the system. And I will also show uh, how to find cases for those instances that we mentioned before in which a marketing authorization, uh, a national competent authority may have sent an adverse event report to the MAH directly to their mailbox. So uh, this ends the presentation and what I'm going to do now, I'm going to share my screen and start the demo. While I log in, I'm going to mention that um, I am using the system, uh, the, par the part of the application that is uh, used for the user acceptance test. We've just finalized a user acceptance test and uh, some bugs were found during the, I will, I will show you this part of the system. So some bugs were found during the user acceptance test, but uh, we have asked uh, the development team not to deploy the version where those bugs have been corrected to the system because we didn't want it to impact the demo. 
So as we do the demo, you may find that some fields are not showing the required information, or we may find some small bugs during the demonstration, but this is due to uh, the fact that they have not yet been corrected. So first, to log in the application, the user needs to enter the uh, username, and if, as I say, as it says here in the guidance, uh, EMA users will sign with their email address, and other users will sign with the username, so their existing username, followed by the text that is shown at the bottom here. So, for example, because this is the uh, part of the system that this test is shown as ID dash test. In production, it will show as production. So, username followed by the information that is shown in the guidance in the application. And then on the password, uh, you need to enter the password that you have been uh, given, that you have been given when you reset your existing password. So you need to reset your current password for if it to uh, in, in order to access the application. So once you've reset your password, you will have access to the Evivet 3 application. So existing username plus new password to access the system. I will say to stay sign, signed on. So um, I have logged in as a user from a marketing authorization holder. So I can show uh, the view from MAHs in the system. In this instance, there is only one organization for which the user I have selected is responsible for. If the user is responsible for m more than one organization, on the, they will be presented with all the organizations they are responsible for in this screen, and they need to select the relevant one for the adverse event report they want to report. So select the relevant organization, click on select, and you will be granted access to the application. So there are various menus at the top of the application. In order to uh, create a new report, the user clicks on AERs, and then the menu that allows you to create and send new reports and search for specific reports and search for patches is shown. So what we are going to do now, I'm going to show you how to create a new report. So you click on Create and Send and click New. And the way that the system works is you've got a menu here on the left-hand side that allows you to collapse and expand the different sections of the adverse event report. And uh, the sections with mandatory fields are shown with a um, mark that looks like this, and they are highlighted in red. And once you complete all the relevant mandatory fields for each section, the red will disappear. I am going to enter, I've got information for a specific case report, and I will show you the data that I'm going to enter uh, to show you how to enter information for a specific report. So in this particular report, the case was received by a marketing authorization holder on the 5th of January, 2022. And 
the report occurred, the case occurred in the Netherlands. Uh, it involves two male dogs that are three years old, and uh, this is the weight of the animals. And both dogs received the products shown below, and the products were administered by a veterinarian and on the 2nd of January 2022. 30 minutes later, uh, both animals experienced vomiting, malaise, and anaphylaxis, and subsequently one of the dogs died, and the necropsy results will be attached to the case. So I am going to use this information to complete the adverse event report. Prior to uh, the report, I have uh, generated the AERID. So what I've done is uh, the AERID will consist, as mentioned before, the country of occurrence. Then I have generated a MAH ID from the routing ID of the organization. Then I've included the routing ID on the third part of the system plus a random number that I have assigned to the case. So each organization will have a, probably a set of values that uh, they will assign on the free text part of the case and they will have their own convention to assign this information so that uh, they don't generate duplicates. But this part, the free part, the only advice that is given is that please include your routing ID to enhance the possibility of not sending duplicates to the system. Where do you find your routing ID? Uh, there are various places where you can find it, but uh, for example, when you log in the system, you can see information here. And if you hover over the information, you can see that uh, one of the items displayed there is called organization ID. In this case, it's Actrivo VP, and that is the routing ID. You can also find it in here on the organization list by searching by, for your organization name. If we have time later on, I can show you how to find the information as well by looking on the organization list. But uh, if there are issues that I cannot cover during the demo, uh, in the next few days, we are going to be publishing a full user manual for the system where all the aspects of the system are described. So uh, don't worry if we don't manage to cover all the aspects of the adverse event reporting and searching because you will find this information on the user manual and also additional information on the best practice guide. And as I mentioned, both documents will be published shortly. They are currently being reviewed by the product owners group and uh, once the comments have been incorporated, they will be published. So the first part that uh, we are going to complete is administrative information. I'm sure all of you have familiarized yourself or are going to familiarize yourselves with the VICH guidelines. Um, they are published on the EMA website and on the VICH uh, website. And uh, one of the differences between uh, the previous guideline, DEG guideline, and the current VICH guideline is uh, that uh, in the VACH guideline, the concept of batch has been entered, so uh, has been included on the guideline. So before there were two levels when uh, a message was sent to EVVET. There was the message level and there was the 
adverse event report level. And within a message, you could send one or more adverse event reports. The VICH guideline uh, mandates that uh, to send information uh, to the system, you need to create a batch. Within the batch, there will be messages, and within the messages, there will be adverse event reports. So, in theory, there are three levels, but to avoid complications uh, and uh, to facilitate uh, communication and data entry, we have actually collapsed those three levels into two levels. So it's almost as before. So what does that mean? Within a batch, you will be able to send uh, various messages, and within those messages, you will send one AER report. I will show you how it means because uh, how it uh, how it is uh, show, uh, how it what this means in the system because it is easier to explain. So each message will contain one adverse event report, and you can send more than one message in each batch. So the first information that you need to complete is VICH batch number. Uh, there are some there's guidance included for each field in the uh, system. So uh, as mentioned here for the VICH batch number, this should be a unique tracking number within the sender organization. So for each batch that you create, you should generate a unique batch number. But there is no convention to as to what this batch number should contain. So you can generate your own convention. In this case, uh, we are going to enter the organization name, for example, then today's date, and then a random number. But as I said, um, this information, you can create your own convention in your organization to ensure that this VICH batch number is unique. I'm going to include the word VICH batch on it so we can find this information later when I show you how to search. And I'm going to copy this information so we've got it ready for later on when I show you how to search for batches and for reports. So please bear with me. I have copied the information. When uh, you log in in Evivet, some of the information is taken from your login ID and organization and is used to autocomplete the report as much as possible. So, for example, the sender information uh, has already been included in the report, it's been auto populated. So, there is no need for you to state that uh, your organization is the sender of the report because it's been auto-populated from the login information. With regards to the batch receiver, this has also been pre-populated with EVVET prod. So this is the receiver identifier of the EMA, EVVET prod. If uh, in instances where you are only one receiver can be stated at the time. So if you are an NCA and wish to send the report that you are going to create to both the EMA and to a marketing authorization holder uh, in case that uh, 
you recognize that the product that you have mentioned in the report is not yet in the product dictionary or the information is not recorded and you wish to send the report to the NCA, to the MAH, what you will have to do is create a report, send it, and then uh, take out the batch receiver information and include the batch receiver ID of the marketing authorization holder and send the report again. So that is the way of sending the report to a marketing authorization holder as well. So we have completed already all the mandatory information related to the badge. And as I mentioned before, uh, you also need to complete the message information. So this the same as the batch, you need to include a message uh, number for the transmission, and it is also unique uh, for each message. So a unique VICH message number should be included on each message that is transmitted to the system. To speed up the information of what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy the batch number and I'm going to change this to message. But you can use any convention that you wish. And for example, a uh, one of the bugs that I was talking about, uh, as you can see, the sender information is included uh, at the message level, but in this instance, the receiver information has not been automatically included. It should be. So when the system goes in production or shortly after, the receiver identifier will be auto-populated with EVVET prod. But because there is a bug, uh, this has not been auto-completed. So we have completed information related to the patch, and we have re completed information related to the message. So now we will continue with the administrative information of the report. In this instance, because the organization that is looked in is a marketing authorization holder, the information shown here is related to a marketing authorization holder. If the organization that is logged in is an NCA, this field will show the NCA information. So this information related to the marketing authorization holder has been auto-populated. So there is no need to manually complete the information. It will be completed with the information of the organization that has logged in. Uh, with regards to the person acting on behalf of the marketing authorization holder, this is not mandatory information. So the advice is not to complete the information because it contains personal details. The rest of the administrative information related, uh, uh, the next part of the administrative information relates to the primary reporter and any other reporter if necessary. So with regards to the primary reporter information, even though there is a, a lot of fields here, the ad, in order to maintain anonymity of the primary reporter, it is advised that only the first uh, letter of the first name and the first letter of the last name plus two digits of the postal code are included on the adverse event report. And the guidance is in order to facilitate the uh, identification of potential duplicate is that 
all that information is included on the last name field. So instead of entering the initial of the first name on the first name field, the initial of the last name on the last name field, and the information related to the postal code, so the two digits on the postcode in the relevant field, the advice is to include all this information concatenated on the last name field because it's a mandatory field. So it will be easier to identify potential duplicates. So I'm going to include the initial, let's say for example, LD, I'll, I'll put my initials, and the first two digits of the postal code. In this case, we will put 34 as the partial information. Uh, in this case, uh, the primary source is in the Netherlands, so we need to complete the country. So you can search for the country by typing on the field and then selecting the information there. And then you need to select also the primary report category. If you remember on the case that I mentioned, uh, the primary source was a veterinarian. So we will select veterinarian from the primary report category list. None of the other information is mandatory, so and it shouldn't be completed. In this particular case, we don't have any other reporter involved, so we will not include the information, but if you had information, let's say, of two primary sources, you had information on the, a veterinarian and then an owner, you can include both information, both sets of information by completing the other report field. Then the next part and final part of the administrative information of the report uh, is the section A4 AER information. So in this part, is where you have to enter the unique adverse event identification number. As I mentioned before, uh, I had uh, already generated an ID following the convention. I'm going to copy it there and we'll explain again what it consists of. So the information that I've included on this ID is the country of occurrence, three-digit country code. Then I generated using the algorithm that I found online, a eight-digit ID, MAH ID, from the routing ID of the marketing authorization holder that I'm logged in with. So I've used this information on the algorithm that I found online, CRC32 hash generator to generate this uh, MAH ID that then this marketing authorization holder can use for all the adverse event reports. So this will not be changed. This part will not be changed for any reports of the marketing authorization holder. It will of the organization that is reporting. It will always remain the same for this organization once this code is generated. Then the advice is to include on the third part of the free text information, the organization routing ID in order to avoid potential duplicates. And then the rest of the information is, as I mentioned before, a free text that the organization can set up their own convention. I hope this is clear, but please, if you have any questions, type them on the chat and we will try to address them either during the question and answer session or in writing after the webinar, if we cannot answer the information, because we do not have perhaps answers to all the questions that you may potentially have today. With regards to the original receive date, is uh, the date in which this organization received 
the initial information on the case from the primary source. Um, we had the information saying that the MAH received the case from the veterinarian on the 5th of January. You can select the date from the calendar. And with regards to the most recent info date, we are going to change the label of this field to date of current submission. So at the moment it's showing uh, the label most recent info date, but this is a bug and it will be corrected and this date will be date of current submission. And as mandated by VSCH, this information should be the current date. As mentioned before, if you are recording a follow-up, you should never change the unique adverse event identification number or the original receive date. But then on this field, on the date of current submission, you will record the date in which you send the adverse event report to EVV. Then the field type of submission. For most reports, the information that you need to select is expedited, unless it is a follow-up or a nullification report. So for initial reports, the value to be selected is expedited. And then if you are sending a follow-up, you will select, the, well, I will show you later on. If you are a gateway organization, if you are sending a follow-up, the information to be recorded in the type of submission field will be follow up. If you are a web trader, uh, when you search for the report that you wish to send a follow up for, in there you can select whether you want to send a follow up or a nullification report, and this information will be automatically completed with follow up if that is what you have selected to do. Then type of information on the report. There are various choices there. So if you are reporting a safety issue, like in this case, uh, you will select safety issue. If it is a report consisting only of lack of expected effectiveness, you will select that one. But if the, if the report has both safety and lack of expected effectiveness aspects, you can select that information. In this instance, we will select safety issue. Now, all the mandatory information has been completed and we will move on. So, we've recorded now all the information related to mandatory fields on the uh, administrative information. And then we will move on to the next, next next section and in there we will start by recording information of the animal or animals so animal data if there are any mandatory fields that we may not have been we may not have entered information for when you validate the report the system will show you errors for those uh, fields that you may not have um, recorded information for, you can click on the error and then correct it. So the next information we are going to record is related to the number of animals treated and affected, the species and breed, and then weight and age of the animal. It is important to complete as much information as possible because then you will be using this information when you uh, sell, view the reports on the data warehouse for subsequent data analysis and signal detection. So the more information that you record in here, the better your analysis will be afterwards. In this instance, we had two dogs were treated and both dogs were affected. 
and uh, you can select in here the species. In this instance, it was dog, so you type the information and the system shows you the values on the lookup list and you can select the species in there. You can only record uh, adverse event reports for one species. If you have various species, you need to send more than one report. So you, you send separate reports and then if there is any type of link, uh, you can link the reports uh, using the report the section B6 linked report, but only one species per report. If you have a human report, a human is a species as well, so you will select the species human. And uh, for adverse event reports related to humans, is only one human per report. With regards to the breed information, you can state whether the animal or animals were purebred or crossbred. If you have one animal, uh, you can state up to three breeds if they are crossbred. So you can state the makeup of the breeds of the animals. Uh, if they are both purebred, for example, in this instance, uh, you can enter, let's say, they are Labrador retriever, so something like you can type retriever, Labrador. So in this instance, let's say both were purebred animals, uh, Labrador retrievers. If instead of that they had been a crossbred, or if one of them had been a Basset and the other one had been a Labrador, you can, but a purebred, so you can enter the information for both breeds in there. And if both were crossbred, you can enter the information related to the breeds that make up the crossbred in here. As I mentioned before, you can enter up to three for one animal. If you don't know the makeup of the breed, there is a unknown option on the select. In this case, let's enter them as retriever. And if we have not covered everything, uh, there will be further information included on the user guidance. So. Anything that uh, is, we have not covered in here, it will be covered under user guidance. You can state the gender, for example, let's say they were both male, and uh, we had the weight of the animals, which was stated as between 30 and 32 kilograms. So, because uh, they are measured, but we have minimum weight and maximum weight because one was 30 kilos, the other one was 32 kilos. We can state the weight of the animals in there. If the weights were approximate, instead of measured, you can select estimated. And if it was unknown, you can select unknown. If you have only one animal, the information should be included on the minimum weight field. The same uh, applies to age. We had uh, information that both animals were three years old, so we can say that uh, they are both three years old. And let's find year in there. So we have completed all the information related to the animal data. And now we are going to include information on the veterinary medicinal products that were um, 
administer to those animals. As you can see, there are various icons here. If you enter information and then you want to delete it, you can use this bin icon to remove it. If you enter information about a product and you want to duplicate it, you can click on this icon and it will copy the information to another product and then you can amend uh, the relevant fields. Uh, as I mentioned before, this all this functionality is described on the user manual in detail. So to enter the information for the first product, we can click on registered name or brand name. And the first product that we are going to enter is a product that already exists in the product dictionary. I'm going to copy the information so it is accurate. You know that a product is already existing in the product dictionary when it has this icon next to it. So this is the most accurate information. And Katerina informs me that we should break for uh, coffee now. So we will have a 15 minutes coffee break and we will continue with the data entry. Uh, so it's 11.22 now, so we'll be back at 11.35. So see you in 15 minutes. So I'm ready when you are, Katerina, to share back. I have Can I intervene you... for one second, Laura? Yes, of course. Yes, so we have been, we have been just discussing with the team on the huge number of uh, questions that came in in the chat so please continue doing that that's that's very good we'll come back to that uh, in the session after the presentation and we have also tried for some of them all also giving the answers um, but we realized because of all the that actually the one who has asked the question sometimes might have difficulty finding the answer then in in the, in the chat so what we're not what we're going to do now is we are going to collect all the questions uh, in the background we will start preparing the answers but we will not answer directly in the chat we will do that when we come back afterwards uh, after the demonstration we come back to the to the questions and the prepared answers thank you so i will continue then can you please confirm that you can see my screen now yes yes very good all there thank you. I'm going to answer a couple of questions quickly that I saw in the chat. I saw one question that was related. What happens if the gender of the animals, if one is male and the other one is female? There is an option to select mix from the list. And with regards to if the animals are different ages, so let's say one was three years old and the other one was four years old, then on the minimum age field you will select three and on the maximum age field you will select four. So I just thought I will quickly address those questions before moving on. Um, with regards to the selection of the products, uh, the product that I have just selected, the first one, is a product that uh, already exists in the product dictionary uh, that is shown by the icon next to it, this desk. And when you select a product from the product dictionary, the rest of the information will be pre-populated. Uh, in this case, we, we have a little bug, like the dosage form has not been pre-populated, but this will be corrected and all the, re all the available information from the Union Product Database will be pre-populated in the report. Um, the next two fields are related to the MAH assessment of the report and the regulatory assessment. This information is not mandatory. If you wish to complete it, the MAH assessment field is text, and the if you're a regulatory authority, you have two lookup lists to, that you may wish to complete, and you can select uh, from the actual assessment from the list, so you may select the possible 
unlikely, probable, and so on, and then uh, provide an explanation related to the assessment in text form. But as I said, this information is not mandatory, so we will not complete the information. If you select the product name from the product dictionary, the information related to the active ingredient or ingredients of the product is also uh, auto-populated. And uh, there is no information, there is another bug related to the strength, but this will be corrected at some point as well. But the mandatory information is uh, the ingredient name or names, and this is pre-populated. With regards to if you are doing manual data entry, these fields are either or. So in an adverse event report, you need to complete either the information related to the product brand name, but in those rare instances where you may have a report with only one uh, product information, but you don't actually have the product name, you only have the active ingredient name. It is possible to only complete information related to that active ingredient on the active ingredient field and leave the registered brand name information blank. As soon as you complete the active ingredient information, the information related to the product name will become not mandatory and you will be able to send the adverse event report. So the next information that we are going to complete is related to the lot numbers. So you enter the lot number in there and you can select that the expiry date is either day, month, year, month, year, or year. So select, uh, and this is a future date. Uh, I'll just, for speed purposes, I'm going to put, let's see, February 2022, but you can select, uh, yes, the lot number is the batch number but uh, in the VICH form is called lot number. And also we, we didn't change the information to batch number uh, in order not to confuse the field with the VICH batch number. So in VICH, the VICH batch number relates to the information, uh, the tracking number. And with regards to what we know also as the batch number or lot number, it in here is called lot number. This information is not mandatory, but is uh, very useful to include it in the report if you have it. And you can enter more than one if necessary. So the next, because the information is repeatable. The next information that may be completed is who administered the product information. In this case, we had information that it was the veterinarian that administered the information. And um, so we select veterinarian. I'm going to get my train, my aid back to see the rest of the information. So uh, the next part uh, is not mandatory information, but uh, as mentioned before, it is important to complete it for signal management purposes. So the next uh, relates to whether the product was used according to label. We are going to include three products in the report. The first information that we are completing is related to the first product mentioned, and this product was used according to label, according to the information we had. The second one will be as well, but then the third one will be uh, of label use, so I can show you how those fields work. So for the first product, we select that it was used according to label. And then, uh, 
the next set of information is uh, not mandatory either, but uh, if you have the information, it is useful to record as much information as possible. So in this case, we don't know whether the, for the information that we have on this report, we don't know whether the animals had been previously exposed to the product, so we can complete unknown. If you have the information, please record it because it is important for the future assessment on the case. The same related to, was there any previous adverse event uh, related to this VMP? We don't know, so we select unknown. If you knew, you can select, if you knew that the animal had previously suffered an adverse event report related to the product, you can select yes. And if you knew that they hadn't, then you select no. And then the challenge, re-challenge. So uh, because uh, we don't need to complete this information because uh, there was no information on whether there was any previous exposure or any previous adverse event report. So we can do two things. We can either select not applicable because uh, there was no previous information, or you could leave the information blank. But uh, in this case, we will enter that we know that there was no previous exposure, no previous, or we don't know whether there was previous exposure or previous adverse event, so we put unknown, actually. If we knew it was not applicable, we will select no, not applicable in this case, because we don't know the information, it is more more correct to select unknown. Sorry for selecting the wrong information previously. So we don't know, so we select unknown. We have um, two more products to add to our report. To add another product, you click on this plus next to the section B.2 VMP data and usage. And then the system will allow you to include information for a second product. So I will repeat again, uh, once you've entered one product, if you need to enter information for more than one product, you go back to the top of the section to VMP data and usage, and you click on the plus next to it. And then uh, as you can see here, this number it was previously one, and now it has changed to two. So it shows that there will be information related to two products. In case you hadn't seen that before, I'm going to delete the second product, and you can see it has changed to one. This is telling you that there is one product included in the report. And to include our second one, press the plus, this has changed to two. So. I'm going to try to speed up the entry, but explain how to search for information for a product. Let's say in this case, uh, the primary source, the vet includes, uh, informs you that they know they have received the product that we mentioned before and also drugs in, but they don't know exactly uh, which presentation and which strength. So you can type the name of the product, and then we see various options here. So the system is presenting you with the different uh, medicinal products for uh, that are included in the UPD. But we don't actually know whether it was the 25 milligrams per milliliter, the 100 milligram, or the 100. So we have those that product's information from the product dictionary has then been broken down into different reporting possibilities to allow you to enter as much information as you had. In this case, the only information that we have is that the animal received Draxin, but we don't know the strength and we don't know the formulation. So the most accurate entry that we can select is this one. If we knew that it was the 25 milligrams per milliliter, but we don't didn't know the formulation, we could select this entry. 
if we knew that there was a solution for injection but didn't know the strength, we could select this entry. But for example, if, there were, if it was a product that had different formulations and different strengths, because we don't know which one, we will select as much information as we have available to us. So in this instance, this entry. And I will not complete any additional information on this. product. So we know uh, that it was the veterinarian that administered the product. And in this instance, we know that it was used according to label. I will not complete the rest of the information. I've shown you earlier how to complete the information so we can speed up the entry. So this is our second product. Uh, I'm going to show you now how you can add information for a product which does not appear in the product database. So let's say you're going to enter information for our third product. In this case, it's called product A. And as you can see, the system is searching, but is not finding the information on the product. So what is supposed to happen here is that uh, I'm going to try again. And if I can't, I will just explain on the interest of time what should happen and is not happening. Okay, I'll type the information again. So what is supposed to happen here, and this is a bug, sorry about this, the system will present us with the information that uh, the product name that we are not search that we are searching for does not exist in the product dictionary. Oh here. So if it shows us uh, I'm going to try This is what happens. So, if sorry about uh, the issues. So, if you type the name of a product and the system does not find an entry in the product dictionary or partial information, it will tell you that no suggestions are found for the name that you are searching for and it's asking you whether you want to add this entry. So, this is what you will do you will click add this as a new product. What it means is that it's adding it to the adverse event report. It is not adding this information on the UPD database. It is just adding this entry to the adverse event report. And for this third product, uh, we had information that it has not been used according to the SPC that uh, it was actually an underdose. So on the use according to label, we are going to select that no, it was not used according to label and that the animals were underdose. So we select yes in that field. You can select one or more of label use reasons when you select that the uh, product was administered not according to the product information to the authorized product information. Then I'm going to move on to recording the adverse event data. So in this field, uh, in this section is where you enter the case narrative. We are just going to uh, enter any random text there. And uh, on the information that we had from the primary source, uh, they said that the animals experienced vomiting, both of them. So we can record the adverse event uh, name vomiting, and we can say that both animals had that, and that we know that for sure. If you're not, if you've got a 
information that various animals had uh, suffered from an adverse event, but it's an estimated, you can record this information as well. So you're going to enter it whether it's, you know for sure or whether it's an estimation. And uh, I will show you how to add another term. So you press the sign and we can say uh, it also experienced anaphylaxis both of them. But only one of them died. So we can search for death. And we select one there, actual. So the next part of the information is the date of onset. Uh, we know that a uh, the reaction occurs 30 minutes after the administration of the product. So we can select here that we know the day, month, and year. We know the full date. And we can either type the entry or we can uh, select it from the dictionary, uh, from the calendar, sorry. Um, we select two. And we don't have information about the duration of the reaction. With regards to the next uh, field, uh, seriousness is a mandatory field in VICH. So we do have to complete this information, although it will not be taken into account uh, as according to the guidelines uh, because it's not, uh, it's now. Uh, there is no distinction for reporting between serious and non-serious reports, and all the data needs to be taken into account for analysis. The advice, because this field needs to be uh, completed, the advice is to follow the VICH definition of serious in order to complete this field. And then, um, we don't have any information on whether the adverse event uh, signs were treated. So we can select, I'm sorry, I meant to click unknown. And then uh, the outcome of the report. We know that one animal died. And we don't know uh, what happened to the others. We don't have any information on whether the reaction is still ongoing, whether they have recovered or they still have some sequel. We, and we know that one of them didn't die. So we can put one animal died and the other one, we're not actually sure what the status is. So we complete one. One thing I have noticed, I have not shown you how to complete a, the information on the date on which the animal uh, was treated with the product. This information can be found on the information related to the route of exposure. I'm not going to go through all these fields now because otherwise we will not have time to show you how to search for reports. There is extensive information on how to uh, record the information related to the dose and dose administration in both the VICH guideline and uh, the user manual that we are going to provide. So you can refer to those two guidance documents in order to learn how to report the information for those. Uh, but I'm going to show you how to record the information related to the date of exposure. So you select uh, as much information as you know. So if you know the day, month, year, you select that you're going to report the date in that format. If you only know the month and the year, you select the format. And if you only know, you, you know very imprecise information, only the year, you can select that. In this case, we know that the animals were treated on the 2nd of January. So we will need to complete this information for all the products, uh, the date 
of exposure. So this is the date on which the animals were first treated by uh, with this product. If it's only a one-off, you enter the date of first exposure. If uh, it is like, let's say, treatment that lasts for a week, you can put date of first exposure and date of last exposure. You can enter as much information as you need. And you should do that uh, for all the products. So in all the products, you can complete the information related to the route of exposure and when the animals were treated with the product. So going back to our information about the um, adverse event data, we have completed that section. And now the next section to be completed is related to the veterinarian assessment of the adverse event. Um, this information can be completed with uh, the view of the veterinarian on whether the um, adverse events were due to the product or products uh, included on the report. Because this information is at report level, it can be stated if there was only one product stated in the mentioned in the report, it is quite relevant to include and code this information in here so we can say whether it's possible, unlikely, or unknown. Let's say that uh, his view was possible. However, uh, in this instance, there is more than one product included in the report. So if the veterinarian has stated that um, there is a, that the, they believe that the reaction was due to one of the products administered to the animal, this information should be recorded in the case narrative because, as I mentioned, um, the structure information field is at report level and not at product level for the view of the veterinarian. So the next section, uh, in this section, uh, linked reports, let's say you received uh, two reports from the same primary source that you wish, uh, you think that they should be assessed together. So you can enter the name of the other adverse event report that uh, you believe should be linked to this one and the explanation of why those reports should be linked in this field. We don't have this case here, so we will not do so. And one thing that is new on the VACH format is that you can actually attach documents to the report to supplement the information that you code and that you enter in the case narrative. So let's say that in this instance, you had a necropsy report and you wish to append it to the uh, adverse event report, so it is there available for analysis in the future. You can save the necropsy report, let's say, in your uh, files, in your system, and then if you click on this information, we can append, uh, if you click on the icon, you can append the report to the, like the necropsy report, let's say, to the adverse event report. And then this field becomes mandatory, attach document type, and in here you can state what type of uh, report or information you are appending. In this case, it was a necropsy report, but there are many other values that you can um, attach, such as laboratory results and so on. So in this case, we said I've lost it. Now I had to find. Okay, so we say that this is a necropsy report, and with this information, we have completed all the information 
in our adverse event report. So we believe so, so we validate the report prior to send it to see if indeed we have completed all the information. So the validation result uh, shows us that uh, we have indeed completed all the information and uh, we are having some warnings in there that some of the product information that we have included in the report uh, is not yet in the product dictionary. But uh, this information does not prevent us from sending the report. So we are going to send the report by clicking on Validate and Send. I'm going to do a couple of things now while uh, the system is sent. Um, we are told that it's been delivered properly. I'm going to copy the AER information so I can show you how to find this specific report in the system after. And what I'm going to do as well, let's say that when you were completing the information on the report, you know that you've got a meeting in 15, 20 minutes and you don't have time to complete all the report and send it before your meeting and you want to save what you've already done or you wish to discuss some aspects with a, co uh, with a colleague. So I'm going to show you how to save a partial report. Unfortunately, at the moment, uh, you need to complete all the mandatory information prior to saving the report. So in order to save a partial report, you will need to complete all the mandatory fields and then in order to save it in your system, you can click on Export XML. Then you can download it. And what we are going to do, we are going to save it. in here, in our system. And now, I'm going to get rid of my report. Hopefully, the system will behave, yes. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the file. So we are now pretending that this was a partial report with only the mandatory fields uh, completed. So we will be able to import it back into the system and carry on completing the information and then validate and send the report. So I will quickly show you again what I did. I had exported the report, then you can go on AER reports, create and send, import XML, select the file that you have saved, and the file will be there imported into the system and you can complete, validate, and send the information. So I will get rid of it again. And now we're going to move on to the searching. So there are various ways in which you can search for the reports, batches, or all reports for a particular marketing authorization holder. I'm going to start quickly by showing you how you can search for a specific batch. So when you go on the search uh, menus, you have criteria, which are the filters, uh, some of them are already pre-populated, and then you have the fields, which will be what shows specific information related to either the batch or the report that uh, you are searching for. You can add more filters to the 
search, for example, in this instance, we have saved our VACH batch number when we started completing the information. Now I need to find where I put it. So I'm going to search based on the batch number that uh, for the pat for the adverse event report that we have currently like we've had to send to the system. It is important that you click update when you search for something. So when you search, you have various options. Matches, which is the the system will be trying to retrieve based on the full value that you enter here, you can search also by begins or contains. So if you search for contains, it will be partial information that you will be searching for. And if you select begins, is any entry that starts with the information that you have selected. In this case, we will search based on the exact batch number. So we select matches, click update. And now we can press the search button and hopefully our batch has already been recorded in the system. Yes, it is, so we can retrieve it. We can view and open the information, or we can download it on XML format in here. And now I'm going to move on. So this is how to find information related to a specific batch, which, as I mentioned before, may contain one or more messages. If you wish to search for a specific report or for reports for a marketing authorization holder, you will do so on this search AER reports uh, section. And I'm going to show you quickly how to search based on various conditions and what that means um, with regards if you are the sender of the report, if you are a marketing authorization holder that has a product involved on the report, and then if you are any other organization uh, that has not sent the report or has a product uh, involved in the report. So the first case that we are going to be searching for is a case in which the organization that is logged in is a marketing authorization holder. So we are going to search based on a specific AER ID. And then we search. As we can see here, uh, the sender of the report was a uh, National Competent Authority, in this case, the VMD, and we are Actribo. When we search for this report, we can see the case narrative, because one of the VMPs mentioned on the report belongs to our organization. However, if you were to look at the primary reporter information, the, the information related to the primary information is not there because this is level two information. So um, this level two information does not give you access to the primary reported information, so this information is not there. However, we have uh, access to the case narrative. Now, let's search for a report that this organization, Actrival, has sent to the system. So I can select another report. I'm going to take the spaces out just in case. So we search, okay, let's try again. 
there is another way of doing it. Let's see. Okay, it seems that my search is not. Okay. So what we're going to do, as my previous search didn't work very well, what I have done, I have retrieved all the reports that have been sent by this organization. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to search by one of the adverse event reports numbers so you can see that the search actually works. Okay, so we can see here various versions of this report. So there is an initial report and a few follow-ups. You can identify which one is the initial report and which one is the follow-up by the local report numbers. So the earlier cases are the initial point and you can view the different versions of the report. Because the this organization is the sender of the report, when you look at the case, you will be able to see any information that has been included related to the primary source and you will be able to see the case narrative. So now let's see if my search works again. What we are going to search now is for level one access. So I'm going to search for a report that was sent by a different organization and that for which this organization does not have any products. So this report. Okay, as we can see, this report was sent by the VMD. And this organization should not have access neither to the primary source information nor to the case narrative. As you can see, the case narrative is empty. So this is an example of level one information. So to conclude, if you are not the sender and you do not have any products involved, you will not be able to view the case narrative. If you have products involved, once the information from the AER report, the product information has been linked to an entry in the uh, product dictionary, you should be granted level two access to the report and you should be able to view the case narrative and any other level two fields. If you are the sender of the report, then you will be able to see uh, all the information in the report. And now, uh, finally, I'm going to show you how to search for products belonging to a specific marketing authorization holder. So you select MAH. As you saw there before, I'm going to explain the information. So on the sender field, in here you can search for reports belonging to the organization that has sent the report to the uh, to EVVET, EVV. If you search on the MAH field, this information is related to who is the owner of the product products mentioned on the adverse event report. So the MAH you are searching for here is uh, the one related to the product or products involved in the adverse event reports, regardless whether they sent the uh, report to the system or not. One thing that I need to mention now, and this is uh, something that for which an improvement has been recorded 
Now, in order to search for the marketing authorization holder, it only works on organization ID. So, and this organization ID is related to the OMS ID of the organization. For this particular, I will show you in a minute how you can obtain this information. So the OMS ID of the organization is the organization ID that is given to all the organizations registered with the SPOR system. So if you, um, let me see if I've got it open. If you have um, registered your organization for any other process uh, related to submission of uh, um, new marketing authorizations and so on, your organization should have an OMS ID and you can search for it. If you don't know it, you can search for it on the organizations tab of the SPOR um, website. So to select, search for example, for the uh, organization that uh, we were mentioning, what I did, I went in the OMS um, website and on organization name, I searched for the um, organization. And the information that I retrieved was the organization ID related to this organization. I don't know how long the search is going to take, but uh, this is how I retrieved this information. And you can search for the organization ID here. It is, okay. So the organization ID, in order to search, it is shown here. And you can copy from here the information, and then you can use this to search on the MAH field. As I said, uh, we know that this is not ideal, and we have already registered an improvement so that you are also able to search in this field based on the name of the marketing authorization holder. But for the moment, I'm afraid that you will have to search based on the MAH organization ID. So what the system will retrieve when we searched based on the product MAH is reports linked to this organization, to products belonging to this organization. As you can see here, the sender of the report may have been either another organization, another marketing authorization holder, or a regulatory authority. But all these reports will contain one or more products belonging to this marketing authorization holder. So, because the organization registered then will have a level two access to all these reports unless they are the sender of the report, in which case they will have level three access. So for all the reports belong for which they have a product involved, they will have level two access. For reports that they have sent, they will have level three access. And for those organizations, like for example, gateway organizations that will wish to download these reports and import them into their system, uh, there is a temporary solution. This is not the final solution for exporting and downloading reports, but for now, what you can do is either select one or more of these reports or you can click at the top here to export XML and you can export 10 reports at the time. And then you can click on export XML and you will obtain a package that you can contain in these reports. And then 
you can save that package and then import it into your system. And this, uh, how to do this will be explained also on the user manual because I can see that it's taking some time to retrieve the information. As I said, we have some bugs at the moment and performance issues that on the UAT system that are being corrected. I know that um, we are um, encroaching into the question time. I think the last thing, I'm going to stop this if I can, but yeah, you will obtain a file that you can then import into your system. I'm going to click here to show you one final thing. Okay, I will exit. Close the browser and try again. Just in case, I will go in incognito mode and see if I can re log in and continue. If this doesn't work, uh, I'm going to delete the history and try again. If it doesn't, is there anybody from the technical team that could quickly <laughs> fix this? So this is a trick. If you have the same issues, that the system becomes stuck, you can clear the browsing data and sometimes it fixes the issues that you may experience. Let's see if this is true. But as I said, this is happening mainly because we are using the UAT system. I will log in again. Hopefully it will let me. Yes. Okay, the last thing I'm going to show you is let's show you how to do a follow-up. Oh, we've got an organization in there, sorry. So to do a follow-up for a specific report, you can search for the report based on the unique adverse event identification number. And then you see this pencil here. This allows you to create either a follow-up or a nullification. So you can click in there. The system tells you that the report has been added to the follow-ups. So you go then to create and send. And what you will have to do, I will show you. So now, as you can see, the type of submission has become follow-up. If you had selected a nullification, you can select nullification. So if you wish to nullify the report, uh, and you can then state the reason why this is a nullification report. If it's a follow-up, what you will need to do then is include any additional information, and you need to give a new batch number because you are sending a new information to the system and a new message number, So, and then include any additional information, so any new a federal term, any new product, and so on. And then uh, you can then send the report to EVVET. If you wish to send more than one adverse event report, and they are very, very similar, you can duplicate them. You can copy the information on this report. So click on duplicate, and then change the information, but this is obviously quite dangerous if you don't change uh, all the relevant information because uh, instead of creating a new report, you may be creating a clone of the report that you have selected. So in there, you will need to change the message number. So give it, so you have then two messages inside the same batch and it's telling you so here and then you will need to change 
the relevant information on the report, the products, and then you can send the information with two adverse event reports. And I think I will stop here with the demo. I have covered uh, how to search for individual reports. I had covered how to search for reports belonging for, to a marketing authorization holder, how to create a report, how to search for a batch, and how to search for an individual report. So now we can take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. That has been very helpful, although you're almost reaching 100 questions. Oh, no. <laughs> if, you, if you were continued, I think we we're close to 90, I think. So, I mean, in 30 minutes, that would mean about 10 seconds per question. I don't think we can make them all. What we promise is that we will look at all of them and try to group them together and answer them afterwards also and publish the, the answers with the Q&As. But well, let's try to go through a number of them. You have, you have already said in the beginning, Laura, that we will be releasing a tutorial. Um, yes. So that should be helpful, I think, for, for quite a number of the questions. And similarly, one question was raised. Uh, Pedro, I don't know, it was asked, when is this system becoming available um, for uh, yeah, for trying out, is there a test system available, uh, the release of that one? Will that be on the 28th, or is there <clears throat> is the release earlier? I don't know if you can. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we, we are about to send uh, that information to, to the users, so we will okay. put the UAT system available in the coming days uh, to try. Thank you very much. Good, good. So I'll start with uh, <clears throat> questions. In the beginning, it was a lot to do about the three-digit code still, um, and also about the routing ID, ID. Where can the routing ID be uh, found? The routing ID is initially provided by the registration team. In the current EVVAT2 system, it can be found on the top right corner of the screen next to your user ID. So that's the answer. If you want to find the routing ID in EVVAT2 currently, you have to look at the top right corner next to your user ID. Um, so we have a number of questions about the user ID. Just in EVVAT3, yeah. you can also find the routing ID next to your login information. So on the top right-hand corner, you will be able to find your routing ID. Very good, thank you. A question about the the ID, the AER ID, it replaces the worldwide uh, number from January 28, question mark, indeed. It's called, and so in the, in the current guidelines called worldwide uh, number and VICH it's called AERID. So just to confirm again that only follow-ups that will be sent from existing reports can be submitted in the old uh, format. So any any new report from the 28 would have to be submitted using the format as presented by, by Laura. So only follow-ups of existing reports can be submitted using the old format in terms of the AER format, the, the ID. And just to reiterate, they will all, always need to contain either the two-digit or the three-digit country code, yeah. because otherwise it's not possible to identify the country of occurrence. So if the existing AER ID in DG format, well, worldwide case number in DG format does not contain the country code, then uh, you will not be able to send a follow-up. You should nullify the existing report and send a new one with okay. the correct format. Thank you. There's one question about the original receive date. If you have sent a case, but you made a mistake, can you then send a follow-up and change the receive date? I 
I think you can. I believe so, yes. Yeah. We will test it and answer that question in writing, but yes, I believe so. Then we're going into questions related to access. So I think um, just to reiterate that you as an headquarter will always get the highest level access of the affiliates. So if the yes. affiliate sends something, you will get um, and has sent the report, the headquarter will have level three. Laura. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, in the next few days, we're also going to send communications to the marketing authorization holders to uh, provide us uh, with their uh, organization hierarchy. So the service desk will be creating the organization's hierarchy based on the information provided by the marketing authorization holders in order to grant this access to the headquarters. Maybe Pedro can complement that. In case I haven't explained it fully. Um, I have nothing to add, no, thank, thank you, Larry, you explained it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Then there are a few questions about the registration process itself. Uh, I think two people asked, "What if you have an EV human account? Uh, what would we? What would you need to do?" Um, I think we need to find figure this out, Laura. Or do you have no, an answer? No, you you yeah. need to register for Yudra Vigilance Veterinary is a separate separately, system, yeah. uh, which has different roles. So you will need to register in Yudra Vigilance Veterinary. And so what about registration manual, manual available? And this needs to be done again for EVVET three. That's the question. If you are already registered in EVVET two, in your vegetarian veterinary two, then you do not need to be registered. If you are only registering if your vegetarian human, then you do need to register to access your vegetarian veterinary as they are separate systems. There, there are some people who seem to have understood that the passwords have to be reset. Is that correct? Yes. Or... Uh, the existing password for accessing EVVET2 and also, for example, the EMA account management system is the same one or the Udralink password. So to access, in order to access EVVET3, you will need to reset this password, your existing EVVET password. And then uh, you will need to use the new password to access all the other systems. Okay, and that can be done already now, is, my, is the understanding, right? Yes, the, the communication was sent recently. I'm not sure whether it was this week or last week, at the end of last week, but very recently. Okay, that answers a few questions about that. Uh, then a question about the narrative. Um, there was Nick, he says, I understood that the narrative will not be available when an MEH does not have full access to the case. If this MEH attempts to download the XML, how will the narrative element B31 be populated? This is a mandatory element. And the question that was prepared, the, the answer that was prepared reads, the narrative element won't be populated in the XML file. It's appropriate XML tag. Uh, and its content will not be printed. You want to add something to that, Pedro, or or Nick? An additional question? I can't see that. Maybe that's that's how how we export because we cannot export that information uh, at the moment. So at the moment, that's how the system does it. Now that you're there about the narrative i think there were some um there was also some questions about the size of the narrative you want to say something about that pedro yeah correct so i commented on the post and and carmen actually pointed out the the guideline text so uh, we'll we'll have a look but uh, in the ich uh, it is stated as 20000 and also in the annex one of our guidance so i believe that there might be a, a an issue just on that particular text, so we will have a look and we'll uh, we'll communicate if that's the case. So we'll make sure that we we made that uh, clarification. Thank you. 
Then the question was raised about so the, the mitigation measure for for products that are not available. One of the agreements is that the NCAs shall forward adverse event reports to the concerned company. What will be the format, uh, the current format or the VSCH format? And uh, the answer prepared is both are possible. Uh, in practice, are there already member states that um, would be sending VICH format? Um, or the web trader. The web trader, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I think the gateway users, member states, they would send the format uh, probably in the current format, right, Laura? That's the expectation. Yes, and, so. and, and, yeah. and the yeah. Um, for adverse event reports sent to the uh, UPHD with a product that is not yet in the UPD, will MEHs be alerted to the fact that recoding has not been possible uh, for the product in the report? Question um, mark. The answer that is prepared reads: A warning will be generated in the acknowledgement, highlighting that the product cannot be found, but in some cases this may be related to partial information being reported, only brand name, for instance. So basically, no, um, we will, in the situation that we're currently in, so where we continuously are being recoding uh, product information, we will not be in a position to alert you when your product is actually be recorded or not. Um, so, but that's, I think it's it's also a temporary situation we're in. Uh, and it, it, it can happen also later on, of course, um, if you have for new products. Um, and then a question from James Mount. Will MEHs have to send reports to each other during the recoding period, i.e. if MEH receives a report which contains a non-recoded product of another MEH, should be receiving MEH send the report directly to the relevant MEH, um, as well as submitting it to the EVV. I, I think this is something that was brought up at one certain moment, James. I don't think we have discussed this with, with the industry. I think it falls uh, besides the really legal requirement, and I would be surprised that the industry would be accepting this as a kind of a agreement for the companies starting to send uh, reports among themselves. So um, I think we have to stay away from that that possibility or that request for the moment. Then there... Um, Sorry, I'm reading questions and trying to see which are the very important ones or covering. Many are in relation to that recoded in the EUPD. So one question is, uh, when will the MEH be informed that is that the product is in there or not? Does the MEH has to control himself, all authorized VMPs and UPD, who will be the recipient of an of an adverse event report, including a VMP which data is not yet included, respectively recorded in the UPD that was collected by the MEH and then the EMA or NCA. So I mean there is no no change in terms of the reporting requirements. Um, and uh, there's also no expectation at this point of from any of the companies to to send product information. So the product information is done directly uh, by the member states and by the agency for CUPS. So, and this is ongoing. So you as a company, you just have to be patient if you don't uh, find your product in case, and we will repeat that also tomorrow, in case you have or you suspect that you have an, a signal with an important risk-based uh, change of the risk-based balance of your product so that it would require urgent regulatory action and you don't find your product for, for example, submitting the, the signal or even the report, then we would advise that you contact the, the, the concerned member state so to make sure that those 
products are entered into the systems and that we can use them. But we'll come back to that tomorrow as well for that situation. And the question is about how long will it take on average for to decode the cases to assign the different product MEHs? Um, I think we have to, not all questions are that clear to me, but we will do some reading with the team to understand and then to find the answer. <clears throat> Can the batch number be the same number as the message number when I send only one adverse event report? And the answer is yes, the batch and message number can be the same. Do VICH batch number and VICH message numbers need to be different or can they be the same? Same question, batch and message number can be the same. Just just one yeah. point there, if yeah. I may. So, uh, in the in the answer, you will find that we are saying it can be the same if uh, the batch contains only one message. Of course, if the batch contains multiple reports, then they cannot be the same because the message number of each report needs to be unique within the batch. Okay, thank you. Clarifying that, Pedro. Laura, I just see your hand, but that's an old hand, I think. Um, well, I was going to clarify yep. for yep. the access uh, of the MAHs to the reports. Uh, tomorrow we are going to show uh, in the data analysis system how to search for data for your products based on the reported information. So we will explain the difference. And in there, for example, if there is a potential signal um, when you access the individual case reports, you will be able to see for which reports you can see the full information and for which ones you do not have all the information. So that is one way of identifying which reports have not been recorded. And then uh, the contingency measures that we mentioned before will come into place. If you think that there is an important signal there that really needs to be follow up, then you should contact both the EMA and the National Competent Authority of the product. Thank you, Laura, for clarifying this. Another question from Paul Cooper. Is there a register of MAH's organization IDs, or does EMA hold the register linking the hashed ID and the MAH name? And unfortunately, Paul, there is no register. It will be kept. EMA will not manage these IDs. Maybe um, if, yeah. I, if I may, sorry to jump in, but maybe right. a clarification on that. So um, the, the that number is not extremely relevant for the EMA. We, we have been communicating these various times. That is only used so that we can make sure that the AER ID is unique. The important numbers for us, as per the current system, are the routing IDs or organi old organization IDs, as you probably know them, because those are the ones that help us uh, identify senders and receivers. So this is just, we need to comply with VICH, so we need to have a number that is unique there and that is formed of eight characters. That's why we, we need that. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. There were a few Questions related to um, the two digits. Uh, uh, sorry, Gilgiria, uh, you have a. You want to say something? Go ahead. I can't see it, Gilgiria. Please speak you, up. You muted. I, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. I just uh, sent a question that was. Um, uh, uh, assigned to you, Josh, uh, by Nick, regarding your previous uh, response. Uh, sorry, I, I, I don't have all this. But <laughs> all you don't that expect the marketing authorization holders or other competent authorities to be sending the new format to EVVET via the gateway immediately, as from the 28th of January. Yes. And is there an, an sorry? Is that a question or is there an, another yes, question? Yes, it is a, a question for you to confirm that this will be the case. 
Um, sorry, repeat or the question. Maybe, oh, Nick, yeah. maybe Nick can raise it, his hand and uh, address the question. I can, I can jump in, Glickery, because yes. I read the question just now. So what, what Jos was saying is that we believe that a lot of the stakeholders will still continue to submit DG yeah. format messages. So we are not saying that no one is going to submit. So everyone submitting from uh, EV web and anyone using EV web will only submit cases in VICH. So we all need to be prepared to receive both VICH and DEG messages. So I think the, the, the realization that uh, Charles was trying to, to present is that we believe that a lot of the stakeholders will continue still to, to submit in DEG for a period of time. As you know, this transition period will last for the next six months. So during that period, both formats are accepted. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much. Then there were a few questions around the use of the initials and the postcode in the surname field and why this is the case. And the background is that this information is being used to help identifying duplicates. It's an old way of trying to identify duplicates, but it was also highlighted by some people for certain member states, uh, if you include such information, sometimes it, it could identify actually the person. And we, I think previously we have answered that type of question saying, if, if you feel that is the case, if the risk is there, then it's your responsibility and you should put withheld in that case. So I was um, trying to confirm that you can withhold that information. There is a button on EV web that allows you to do that as well. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. And then there's a confirmation that EVVET will be supported by EVVET 3 by any modern browser, so Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox, so the latest versions which should be able to work with it. Eve, if um, I may just on that question, yeah. if you don't mind. Sorry to keep Go interrupting ahead. you with that. No, no, please. Yep. So we, we fully support Chrome, and that's the browser we use in all our tests and development. Uh, we will do uh, our best effort to support other compatible browsers. So this will mean that normally uh, um, Edge will work, uh, Firefox will should also work. And uh, if you find any issue with any of the other browsers, please report, and we'll try to, to make it work also on those browsers. Only modern browsers, so you will uh, don't try to use old browsers like Internet Explorer, so because it's likely that it will not work properly. Um, then there was a question about: Is the lot number the same as the batch number? No, it is the product batch number. So the wording "lot" is actually to avoid confusion with the VICH batch number. So when we talk about lot, it's about the product batch number. It's a bit confusing, but we have two batches there. You have the VICH batch number and you have the actual lot number, and that's the product batch number, the lot number. It's not mandatory, it's also confirmed. So if you have any doubts on whether Information is mandatory. It will be in the guidance, and you can also find it directly in the in the relevant VICH guidelines that are online. They're all indicated there, which ones are uh, mandatory or not. We are. I'm going to take one or two more. I think we had the ones on the characters. Um, something about the about the dosage inform, information. Is there a free text field, Laura? Because sometimes I don't remember exactly. Is there a free text for the dosage? No, In, there is uh, structured information. We have included uh, various. Uh, items on the user guidance on how to fulfill this information and also on the VSCH guideline on GL40 there is uh, various scenarios on how to complete this information. Thank you. There were a number of questions on when and how to use actually batches. So 
is there any particular situation that you that you would prefer that we use the same batch or that we can continue to use a different batch for each case? Pedro, is there are situations where it's better to use to submit as batch or at just case by case? It's um yeah, it, I, I, I think in one of the questions similar, I refer to the ICH guidance. So you have the option to group them in a batch if you want. There is no particular recommendation or, or anything that we would do. There were also some questions about linking the cases and if the batch could be used to link the case, definitely not. So if you need to link cases, there is a specific field, which is B6 from the VICH guidance where you can link reports together. Uh, the fact that they come in the same batch has, as I say, has no uh, meaning uh, for us. It's just we process the batch and we store the information, but we don't consider them being linked. I'm thinking, taking the last question from Nick again. Please, can you also show how the MEH will exclude reports they themselves have submitted? Question mark. I.e where the sender is not the MEH. And then in brackets it says, in order to find reports involving the MEH products, which they do not yet know about. So I think the question is about, is there a way to find those products that um, you have not sent yourself? I'm not sure if Laura wants to say something, but I, I can. Yeah. So you can do this by ordering in if you want. So you have the option to order by by the the, the sender, uh, and you can check and make sure that you you do them like that way. Um, I also mentioned that uh, we have uh, uh, in, improvements or new functionality for exporting that is planned for this year. So this year will be continue to improve that uh, and make sure we have better functionality for the export. So that's part okay. of the plan. So thank you very much, Pedro. So that would help then the company to identify those ones that they themselves have not have not submitted. That I think that's the intention of the question. Yeah. Okay, I think we've reaching reaching the end of um, over three hours, and I really have to thank Laura again. And you need some rest now because you have a similar thing to do tomorrow when you can again show us. Um, how are we going to retrieve the cases uh, in the data warehouse from the point of view of signal detection? And I'm inviting everyone tomorrow to be present for that, those presentations and be so active again with your questions. I'm sure you will have many questions about signal management as well tomorrow. So you're giving us a lot of work still, and we're happy to do that. We're going to go in those questions that we have not been able to address uh, and those will be published or incorporated in the Q&As. So thank you for now. Thank you, Laura, again. Thank you all for participating and hope to see you back tomorrow.